So let's try it again. Sunday number one, Sunday number two, Sunday number three, Sunday number four, and then yes, <laughs> yes, Christmas. Right. Let's try that Christmas one. What's this candle for? Christmas. It's super fun. So who wants to help me light the first candle? Yeah, Christmas. You want to help me light it? Okay, I'm going to, I'll pull the trigger. You direct my flame. Okay, boom. Ready? No, not over there. Bring it back. Okay. Good job. This is the first week in Advent. That means we've got three more weeks and then... Christmas! So we've got three more weeks and then Christmas! Tell everybody what we're looking forward to. Christmas! All right. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, you guys ready? I'm going to read some Bible verses. Here's our call to worship for today. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We're going to read, the, read uh, our call to worship. Our call to worship is right in the bi- right in this, in the bulletin, and it's from the Bible. It's Romans 10, verses 20 through 21. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel he, did he say, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. You know what that means? That God loves us all the time. Even when we disobey, even when we're a little bit mm, grumpy, he still holds out his loving hands to us. He's waiting for us, and we're waiting for him. Thanks for helping me with Advent today. Thanks for helping me with the candle. You're welcome. Thanks. (laughs) Merry Christmas. It's coming soon. Christmas is coming soon. All right, let's grab a seat. We'll start singing. One voice speaks for the voiceless, hope for the hopeless, Emmanuel. One love brings us together, now and forever, Emmanuel. Sing glory, Scripture reading comes from Isaiah 40, verse 1 through 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken.
this Advent, as we, um, a- as we look forward to Christmas and celebrating uh, the birth of God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ, um, we're going to be looking at some characters within the Scriptures who uh, were in and around the, the Advent se- season and, and, and just kind of building up to, to Christmas. And so today, we're going to be taking a look at Zechariah and Elizabeth. And, and so we've got, we have the story recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a neat guy. It's a great gospel. Luke um, was a physician. He's a doctor. He was educated. And, and he went about... Um, the work of, of compiling together the story of Jesus Christ in a really organized way. He did a, he did a ton of research. He went and found, um, you know, and, and hung out with Mary. And, and you, could, you could just kind of tell that, that Luke was hanging out with Mary. And Mary, um, you know, told some, Luke some of the details about the birth of Jesus that uh, none of the other Gospels contain. And, um, and he also spent some time with Peter and um, before Peter was, um, was martyred, before he was killed. And you just get this, this little character of a very well-organized, but also just the details that come from hearing from people who were right there with Jesus. And so today, we get to hear about Zechariah and Elizabeth a story that maybe not everybody would love to, for everybody else to know for all time. But here you go. Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, right there in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5, reading in Jesus' name. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all of the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. That is the really nice way of saying they were old, like really old. So we get to know uh, a little bit of, of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And, you know, Zechariah and Elizabeth are married, and they, and they both come from religious families. They, uh, Zechariah is a priest. He is a, he is a professional in the, in the temple, and he served uh, uh, outside of Jerusalem at, in, in a community. It would be similar to what we would consider a pastor today. Um, and, and, and Elizabeth, his wife, and what does God say about them? I mean, if you were to describe anybody in your family, you just, maybe you spend some time with family over, the thanks, over Thanksgiving and you could, you know, describe some, some of your family members to somebody else who doesn't know them. Well, how would you describe Zechariah and Elizabeth to people who don't know them? The way that God describes them is he calls them both righteous before God. Righteous before God. That word has a kind of multiple meanings, dual meanings. One of the one of the primary meanings in righteous and before God means that they have a right relationship with God. That they believe that God is God, and they trust Him for salvation and for His plan of salvation. They are righteous before God. It also means they have a tendency to do the right thing in God's eyes. They have a, they're not perfect, but they have a tendency to do the right thing in God's eyes. And so they both have a, a right relationship with God, and they have a tendency to do what is right in God's eyes. God says this, and they're like, oh, okay, I'll do that. They're not perfect. We're going to see that later. <laughs> but, but they're righteous. They, have, they walk blamelessly in the commandments and the statutes, which means they have a tendency to do the same thing and nobody's accusing them of wrong, but they don't have any kids. During this era, not having kids is not like today. If somebody doesn't have kids today, we don't look at them and say, what's your problem? But in this era, if you did not have kids... There was an assumption. 
the assumption was one of you sinned. Well, this is probably him, but it might have been her. If you don't have kids, somebody sinned. That's the assumption. It's not a right assumption. Lots of assumptions are wrong. I make those all the time. But people would have assumed at this time that somebody's got some hidden sin going on back there. Not having kids was kind of a big deal. There was no one to carry on the family name, no one to take care of them when they, when they aged. And so as they were getting into their later years, since they were both advanced in age, this is what happened. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, that means it would be his job to go to the temple in Jerusalem at a specific time. And according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. This is literally a once-in-a-lifetime chance. You get to do this if you are chosen once. Now, casting lots, this is pretty... Pretty interesting stuff. The way in which the priests back then would ask God a question is they would have either like carved bone or something along those lines, like, like dice, but not exactly, okay? And they would cast these lots before the Lord. And so they'd ask God a question. God, who should burn the incense today? Now, it's a little different. When we, today, when we said, hey, who should, burn the, who should light the candle today? I just said, I'll do it. I did not cast any dice. I didn't ask the Lord, actually. I just kind of said, all right, I'll do it with the kids. But in this case, they have to cast lots. That means they take these dice or something like that, and they, they have to roll it. And for an answer to come back that they knew was from the Lord, it had to give the exact same answer Three times. So they were asking, all the priests were getting together and like, all right, let's ask God who wants to light the incense today. And they like, ch -ch 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 -ch, Yahtzee. Oh, no, wrong. Lord God. And they, throw, and they throw, the, throw the bones down and they're like, okay, one. Lord God. Two. Lord God. Winner, Zechariah, gets to burn incense today. And once he's burned incense in the temple of the Lord, in the, in the holy place, that's the only time he will get to do that for his lifetime. It's a massive privilege to enter into the holy place for us. We have access through Jesus Christ, our high priest who invites us to come in. For Zechariah, this is a one-time deal. So, Zechariah gets to offer the incense. And verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him, that Zechariah, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw it and, fell up and, and fear fell, up, fell upon him. He's scared. Well, yeah, nobody else is supposed to be inside the holy place, just him. And he walks in and somebody's standing there. Oh, and it's an angel. And the normal reaction when you see an angel, a holy angel is to be scared. There's not very many people who don't get scared when they come face to face with an angel. Not sure what it is about them. I'm pretty sure it's their holiness. Face to face with an angel, he's standing on the right side of the altar where he's supposed to be offering incense and he's just blown away and crazy scared. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. 
and you will have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared." And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm, a, for I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Pause. Angel says to Zechariah, Hey, your prayer's been heard. Your wife's going to have a great baby. Congratulations. Woo! At which point, Zechariah may have been thinking, when's the last time I offered that prayer? I was like, decades ago. What are you talking about? I'm old. My wife's old. We haven't prayed that prayer in a long time. What? I don't even know if Zechariah really was listening to the rest of the really great stuff that the angel says to him about his son and about the ministry that his son, he's good, he tells him before his son is even conceived, he gets to hear that his son is going to be a man of God. Imagine that. Like before you even give birth to the child to get to hear all of this really great stuff about what God is going to do in and through your kid. He's going to be great before the Lord. He's going to come in the, in the spirit of Elijah. He's going to prepare the way of the Savior. And it's all going to happen right through your kid. And Zechariah says, prove it. I'm old. She's old. We can't have kids anymore. Prove it. How do I know this is going to happen? That was not the right thing to say to an angel, apparently. I don't know what else happened in, the, in Gabriel's day. You know, I just, you know, when something bad happens, you know, or somebody's acting uncharacteristically, you know, kind of harsh or grumpy, my, my, hesita- my norm is to just kind of get irritated with them. Heidi, Heidi is absolutely awesome. Heidi's norm is to say, oh man, they cut you off in traffic? They must be in a real hurry. I wonder what's going on in their life. My reaction is, get off the road! You can't drive? You certainly shouldn't be driving when it's snowing out. Get off the road! I got onto, I got onto 169 went off of 494 last night. And the car in front of me was doing 40. 40. I'm like, get off the road. Come on. Heidi, she sees people and she's like, oh, man. I wonder if they're like a brand new driver. Or maybe they've never driven in snow before. She's just sweeter than I am, that's for sure. Everybody who knows Heidi knows that's true. As Zechariah stands before the angel Gabriel and says, prove it, Gabriel, well, it looks like he responds a little bit more like me, but with a lot more power. Verse 19, an angel, and the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Oh, he's in trouble. Yeah, he's in big trouble. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, verse 21. And they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he, he kept making signs to them 
and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went home. It'd be kind of like me coming out of one of these rooms, you know, and unable to speak, and I tried to do the sermon just like this. I don't know how long you guys would wait, to be completely honest, but consider the fact that you guys are all sitting in nice, comfy chairs. The people who were waiting in the temple were all kneeling on stone. Yeah, there's a, there's a stone patio out there, and all of God's people who were waiting at the time of incense were all kneeling, like on their actual knees, on a stone floor. And when he takes a little while, you know what happens to your knees after you're on stone and you've been kneeling down for a long time? Yeah, your legs start to fall asleep or maybe you get a little cramp in your hamstring or something along those lines. Or maybe just like your, your knees get sore. And for every single one of you who's like, is he done yet? Is he done yet? Is Jay, is Jay going to keep preaching? How long is this going to take? Imagine that you're waiting that entire time for Zechariah. And when he comes out, he doesn't even say anything. He's just like mute. And he's like pointing. Big trouble. Zechariah, a man of God, righteous in the eyes of God, blameless according to the law, a priest didn't believe. He didn't believe that God would answer an old prayer. He didn't believe that God would be sending a son to him. He didn't believe that his son was going to be coming in the spirit of Elijah. He didn't believe what the angel said. Verse 24. After these, these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach from among the people. I think he believed. You see, somewhere along the way, after he's literally speechless, after Gabriel says, Shut up, and listen. Stop doubting. Stop talking. You'll be silent. And just listen. God's going to do this in his timing. He's going to keep his promise. And guess what? It's going to happen whether you believe it or not. And somewhere along the way when he goes home, I think... Zechariah believes because he definitely goes home and sleeps with his wife and sure enough, she conceives. She's so blown away. Doesn't seem like she's having trouble believing. She's so blown away. She's so excited that she just kind of stays hidden inside her house. She doesn't go out for five months. For five months, she doesn't go out. Just waiting to make sure that everything is, like, for real. And then, check out verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth. And she bore a son, just like the angel promised. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, just like he promised, lots of people are going to rejoice. Lots of people are going to have joy. That's what this is all about. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, no. And he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives are called John, called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet. And he wrote, his name is John. 
And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed. And he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all the neighbors. And all these things were talked about throughout all of the hill country of Judea. And all who heard, heard them laid up in their hearts saying, what then is this child to be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And Zechariah, he starts worshiping God. He just starts prophesying. And he just starts saying, blessed be the Lord God. God's doing great stuff. Salvation is coming. Salvation is coming. And my kid, this kid named John, he gets to prepare the way. Salvation is coming. And John gets to prepare the way. Today, as we, as we worship, as we pray, as we celebrate, I have no idea what you're praying for. Apparently, when you start praying, God is listening. Now, we might get a little grumpy when God doesn't answer our prayer on our timeline. Zechariah and Elizabeth, Zechariah seemed a little upset. He's like, you're going to answer that prayer now, God? But God's timing is absolutely perfect. It's going to happen when he wants it to happen. And God has had a plan for salvation from the very beginning of from the very beginning of time, God has had a, a plan of salvation for his people, for us. Keep praying. Keep praying that the, the Lord would come back. Keep praying. He will keep his promises. He promised to send a Savior. He sent a Savior. He promised to send somebody to prepare the way for the Savior. He sent John. Keep praying. And I get it. It's hard when our prayers don't get answered the way we thought. For each and every one of you who's believing in Jesus Christ, keep believing. God's answering prayers. And your Savior has come. He was born. And he gave his life so that we could be given life too. For each and every one of you is having trouble believing like Zechariah and you're just kind of doubting a little bit and you want to just say to God, prove it. Keep listening. Keep listening. God is answering our prayers and God is answering his promises. He's given his son, Jesus Christ, our salvation. He's given John to prepare the way of salvation. And, and listen to the ministry of John. How cool is this? John's ministry brings families back together. Sons, are, sons' hearts are turned to their father. John's ministry prepares an entire nation of people to receive the Savior, Jesus. And so we keep on talking about John because that's John's job. Today, as you're hearing this word, as you're receiving communion, as you're worshiping him with your singing, stop doubting. Maybe it's time to even just stop talking and listen to what God is saying to you through his word. God has salvation ready for you. Believe it. Receive it by grace through faith. Keep praying. Jesus is coming soon. I don't know when. He said none of us will know. But that's his plan. His version of soon isn't our ver version of soon, apparently. But God's got this. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we're prone to doubt. We want to see proof. We want to see evidence. And, and Lord, we are an impatient people. We pray and we want to receive it right now. I think of us even praying for little Mackenzie and how much we would love to see her brought to full health. 
And Lord, our, our prayers are impatient. But you, Lord God, have a, a plan of salvation for your people. And so, Lord, please help us to listen. Give us the faith to believe that you have given your Son our salvation and that he will come back. We love you, Lord Jesus. Help us to listen and believe. In your name we pray. Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Receive this blessing. Oh, don't forget to grab some of those, those little uh, invitation cards. I'll have some in back. Um, maybe some of the ushers could grab a couple and hand them to you on the way out. But uh, grab one for you so you know what, what's going on this month. And grab one for uh, one or two for some of your friends and neighbors who who you've been wanting to invite so that they too can hear what God has done for them. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May he look right at you and give you his peace. Amen? Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.